much for accepting my invitation to come on my, my YouTube series, Asking the Hard Questions, What Legacy Are We Leaving Our Young? So just by way of introduction, you know, Global Leadership Director of New Pedagogies for Deep Learning and a worldwide authority on educational reform with a mandate of helping to achieve the moral purpose of all children learning. Former Dean of the Ontario Institute of Studies in Education at the University of Toronto. You advise policymakers and local leaders around the world to provide leadership in education. And I've, I've attended many of your talks. I follow you and you hold a, a deep interest for me. That's why I've gravitated to inviting you to come along because you're such a respected voice in the field of education globally. Thank you. So you're welcome. And Michael, we kick off with asking you, what is your key research area at this point in time? And has the occurrence of COVID-19 impacted your thinking in terms of the future of education? Yeah, and I'll try not to put too much historical context, although, you know, in terms of my personal development, although that's obviously very relevant uh, to do the work. Uh, I would divide my, let's say my 50-year career in kind of two chunks. The first half of it, the first 25 years or so, I was a researcher. So I was at the university, I was a sociologist. We did a lot of research inside schools, et cetera. And then halfway through that, around 1988 or 1990, I became Dean of the Teacher Training School at the University of Toronto. So I moved from the graduate school to teacher training. And Very then good. immediately I was forced to deal with the practical. And so we set up a partnership with schools and school districts. Uh, and my first act of innovation at the new place, which was quite stagnant, was to light a firecracker, I guess I'll say, uh, uh, into the institution by saying, we're gonna partner with schools and school districts to see what the university can do to help schools and what the schools can do to help teacher development. And yeah. that's where I got uh, immediately established into having to do something and then uh, that led 12 years later to becoming the advisor to the Premier of Ontario, Dalton McGuinty, where he was elected to transform education in Ontario in 2003. And so then I became exceedingly practical because we were trying to change the system that was stagnant. And as I did that, my, uh, I guess I'll say my research intellectual interests, which is how to understand change and how to improve things, became a moral uh, question. Journey, yeah. How do you raise the bar and close the gap? And what about the disadvantage? What about equity? And I always have a practical bent. So I'm what I'm uh, roaming through is the practicality of improving while studying this, sure. the uh, importance of doing it in a micro way that is within every school and community, mm -hmm. but also a macro way change, uh, frame the policies so they're more favorable. So yeah. my current work is uh, square on uh, what I would call, uh, uh, we call it engage the world, change the world. Uh, that is mobilizing students to be learners and change agents seamlessly. Very good. At this, on the same day, but obviously I... that we develop them and they develop themselves in schools that wanna do this. So we partner with them. Last thing I'll say by way of introduction, I have a, a kind of a cardinal finding that says 80% of my best ideas come from leading practitioners. So we're really getting the insights and leading practitioners, I'm including, let's say six-year-olds, 10-year-olds. Right. I'm, ta I'm talking about students as change agents, as well as learners. Really engaging them. Yes. Right. Yeah, yeah we have a model for that uh, uh, that's based on the six C's, uh, uh, Character, yes. citizenship, you know, uh, probably the model. And that we've changed the curriculum from the obsession on academics to the focus on purpose, belonging, and meaningfulness, but okay. then pursuing academics from that more fundamental, I'll say, uh, uh, neurological uh, basis of, uh, of well being and mental health and the yes. complete child. And that is so pertinent now, particularly as schools, et cetera, go back to a new norm. We can't return to the status quo, but it's perhaps a brilliant time 
to actually grasp this opportunity to instill change. I joke that the teachers of Ireland overnight pivoted to online delivery. And the capacity is there and the capacity and resilience is there with the children. We often underestimate them. But just coming to this notion of moral purpose and spiritual leadership that you are big on, and you, you, you talk about moral purpose writ large. The leadership benchmark worldwide, according to the DDI uh, reports that has come in from, the, to, from America, they say that the leadership bench is diminishing in organizational terms, largely due to burnout at the hands of COVID-19 and all that came with it in terms of dependence on leaders to lead. In this context, talk to me about the cultivation of leaders in the field of education. Okay, so let's take, um, let's take moral purpose. I've uh, evolved from moral purpose and uh, uh, the next level up, if you like. And right. the next level up, you actually mentioned the word is spirit. And uh, we just finished a book, it's published, uh, it will be published October 25th. That's okay. called uh, Spirit Work and the Science of Collaboration. Excellent. And it's, uh, yes. it captures, uh, in this particular case, eight districts in the United States that are doing this. And so we really are now looking at transcendental side of human evolution. I hate to put it in those general terms, but it's got specific meaning. If I go to your question directly, uh, that, uh, Let's take December 2019 before uh, COVID, uh, December 2019. Uh, mm -hmm. The school system was pretty terrible then for the majority of students. Uh, it just was blah. Uh, the, best, the best word I can think of is blah. That's the most favorable. So it wasn't going anywhere. And some leaders were get, getting scores in literacy and numeracy, but there wasn't any heart to it, I guess I want to say. Then. Sure. And then the pandemic came along and, and blew it open. And then I think, uh, I, 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 and we have, we've been, our team has been tracing all over the world uh, what's happened in the transition, what are the issues, and we, we will have the same ones as do. We published about it, uh, all, all of that. And the, the way to put it, I can think I'll say um, objectively, is that the future is up for grabs. I don't think it's the future is now more assured even though the opportunity is there for that. I think it could go either way because Absolutely. the world is such troubled uh, a situation. Now to your leadership thing, I think uh, prior to COVID, there weren't many leaders. I'm, I'm thinking of school leaders and uh, uh, system leaders, whether it's at a regional or, or, or state level. Uh, and it's not, it's not a criticism. It's just the nature of the system then. Uh, we're not very uh, fundamentally uh, going for human development and, uh, and basically they weren't. They were going with the literacy, numeracy, high school graduation, which had, I'm gonna say from 2000 to 2010 was not a bad agenda. But after 2010, when things started to really get uh, onerous, uh, it's become less and less the agenda and culminated in the pandemic discombobulation, which turned everything upside down. And uh, one thing I say about leader, two things I say about leadership, the turning upside down has provided opportunities for leaders who were inclined this way that I'm talking about, the human development right. leaders, to thrive and develop and step in under the under the worst circumstances, step in and find uh, the the road, uh, the direction of of salvation or amelioration or whatever. Mm -hmm. uh, and and there weren't very many leaders like that, but they were able, the ones that were uh, had a propensity for that, really found themselves in a kind of a best case scenario for the kind of leadership that they represented. That was a minor part. And then the, the most leaders floundered because they couldn't handle, they could handle the old safe one, but not get big results, but they sure. couldn't handle the discombobulation. And so they were at sea. And now we find the new leaders stepping in. And there's a kind of uh, dual uh, uh, kind of phenomenon right now is many leaders, even the good ones, let's say, are burning out under this tremendous pressured situation. They are really floundering because just the sheer overwhelming of mental and physical and social uh, complexities that are dynamite every day almost. So 
they are really uh, to demands. But what the silver light we see, silver lining, is that some of these uh, leaders now and new ones are stepping in and they're finding it, the greater the complexity in a sense, the more uh, that the challenge is attractive to, yes. for, from a human development point of view. And so I really think that those, those that are stepping into the plate now have a different mindset and they also are teaching students differently. And if you project it far enough, the way we teach students in the new way is going to produce better leaders as sure. we go for the future. Sure. The trick is to capture the energy now, though, isn't it? If you think of the distributed leadership model, it works and it doesn't work. It demands trust, doesn't it? And it demands full delegation when you're delegating. So perhaps these budding leaders who hadn't been given a voice until crisis happened now have found their voice and that should be capitalized on. I, yeah, I hope so. I think what happens is, uh, and we've, been, we've written about this in short kind of uh, analyses uh, that are available on our website, uh, but one, um, one thing that's a predominant uh, preoccupation in the US, for example, is how do we make up for learning loss? So we, we've lost all this learning. If we say that's the absolutely diametrically wrong way of thinking about, about the change, if you make up for learning loss, you try to reproduce a system that wasn't working in the first place. Yes. Yes. And so what they do is they squander and inhibit the development of the leaders that you're talking about. I'm talking about students as well. Uh, so that's one part that uh, I never did, uh, on the second part, I never did like the concept of distributive leadership. Uh, in all my 50 books, I've never written about it favorably uh, because it has this connotation is that you democratize leadership in a segmented way that, okay, you do this, you do this or that, and you don't get the, what I call the systemness yes. happening. You don't get the coalescing. And you get the um, individualistic uh, distributed leaders, but you don't get the organization being yeah. different because that requires a democratization of leadership, which is a different uh, kettle of fish. And we use, uh, we, I think we coined the concept. Uh, now we do, uh, called connected autonomy. Sure. That's our, that's our, that. Who calls that, yes. And the connected autonomy is that uh, this leadership should come from all quarters. Now we have with our new pedagogy, students who are learning about change and about the uh, key learning concepts simultaneously. So they can be change leaders. We say, we've never met a student young enough who's not a change agent, potentially. Sure. So I'm thinking, uh, you know, I'm thinking about five-year-olds, but let's take 10 to 12-year-olds, fantastic resources where learning and change agentry is a two-way uh, uh, right. Yeah, Absolutely. and that's, uh, that develops from there. So I think, uh, I think we have to re conceive leadership, make it uh, broader so that it's um, uh, younger and younger, encompasses the whole thing, make it less individualistic and make it coalesce around connected autonomy and system nets. Yeah, and, and resting on student voice and giving, and capturing that innovation and that newness and excitement of childhood. Very yeah, And, and I, I find, I mean, when I push this, I find uh, so many attractive concepts at the end of the day wanting. So let's take a student voice and student agency. Yes. I think those are romantic and desirable and yeah, yeah. Uh, but what I want is student enactment. I want the, I want the doing of change. You want the real thing, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah they can't, I just don't want them to speak up because we invite them. I want them to be uh, really part of the change. Change uh, agents, yeah. Change agency and change change improvement agenda. It could be climate and macro stuff, but it could be local in your own community. And it's around, when you use the six C's, you get this democratization and an emphasis on enactment or doing. Sure. So that calls really for a change of mindset also for the teachers and for the leaders that we have in the system that heretofore rested on the traditional approach. So the trick really is to get into teacher education um, colleges and start training the teachers at that level to be open to this type of leadership. Yeah, I think it's a question of doing it simultaneously. So I, I uh, when we, when I'm 
opened that partnership in 1988 between the university and the local districts, I said uh, that we were not going to start with teacher education, start with teacher education and feed uh, improvement into the schools. We were going to start with improvement in the schools and feed it back into teacher education. Oh, right. uh, that, that's an important emphasis. So I think, I think what we do is we, we change because now change is happening rapidly, uh, uh, so rapidly that we've never seen it before. So you need to act today. You can't, you can't take three years to prepare someone. You have to start doing it today with what you have. So I think there are a lot of uh, takers, and you said that student, teachers will find the change I'm talking about uncomfortable. And only, that's yes and no. Uh, I, think, uh, I think initially it's uncomfortable because it's so different, but you can, uh, we call it go slow to go fast. You sure. can get into the new stuff and when it clicks, you know, you I'm become thinking, invigorated by it. Yeah. It, it, it accelerates. So I'm thinking I'll be a little bit overly spe specific here, but if I think of a two year period, the first six months is establishing the new agenda, talking and building trust, building relationships, don't push too hard, the go slow part. And then you introduce the agenda, you start to do things six months later, and then it starts to, the students get involved, teachers get involved, parents love it, it starts to accelerate. And by the time you're starting year two, it's got momentum. And by the time you end year two, it's got a place. And is that approach being adapted by many nations at this stage? Yeah, I would, I would put it this way. If we take the three levels, it oversimplified, the local community level, uh, the middle level, which might be the regional district or municipality, and then the macro level, the policymakers. Uh, the way I've just described it, when you uh, when you have it, uh, when people can see what it is, it's more attractive that the attraction is inversely related to the hierarchy of the system. In other words, people at the bottom see the attraction faster than people at the top, at the top and so that's that's just one phenomenon. But also, uh, we, in our deep learning, um, two things about our we call it NPDL, NPDL, New Pedagogies for Deep Learning. It just happens to be the name. Uh, but we have found, uh, first of all, we have uh, something like 12 countries now with 3,000 or more schools. We're having a deep learning lab, virtual one on November 1st, 2nd, and 3rd, where people are flocking to it. So two points. One is prior to the academic, we already had a lot of takers who were saying, and we tend... We never work with individual, we hardly ever work with individual schools. It's always networks or combinations or districts. And we found those that, that initial tranche was very attractive. This I'm now talking 2016 and then 20 on, onward from there. It got more and more. It was still a bit foreign to people. Testing was still a bit too dominant, but it started to change. And then um, COVID gave it a, a whack in the head uh, to really change it. And then now, we found we find the interest growing. I'll say daily. Every day, uh, we get a call from somewhere in the world saying, "We liked your deep learning. We've we've started into it. We want to join up. How do we do that?" And and this is happening a mile a minute right now, uh, because of the uh, consequences of COVID. Have you have you had interest from Ireland in relation to this? Uh, yeah. Uh, have you? I, had not enough, um, you know, and I did, I, I know, I'm, I mean, I'm Irish by descent and, uh, and my, both, both my grandparents' families were from Ireland and I uh, have a very uh, strong affinity and uh, uh, I was a, you know, good colleague of uh, Johnny Coulihan and, uh, and you know, the, and right, we, yes. we went over and I, for 10 years, up until about five years ago, we did um, workshops with the primary principals right. association in uh, small towns all through Ireland. I've, I've attended them. I've yeah, attended and I was them, one yes. of, there's in fact one in Thurl I did. Uh, uh, and so, so uh, I know that system. And I would say it this way, they, they, there's a, uh, a hunger or an interest on the part of the primary school principals. I'm just thinking that because that's who I saw the most in doing this, but there wasn't really, uh, the, the, the system was too piecemeal for it to click. And those in charge at the top never really quite got it as a proactive step towards the future. Yes. So it didn't have the it didn't have the breakthrough push the, either from the bottom or the top. So I, I think of it as a uh, an opportunity that was missed so far. But but I'm I'm pretty sure I can say this, and you know it better than I do. 
there is a propensity in Ireland among the educators, among the young, among the parents, among the society to do this work we're talking about. There is a strong interest and to make leadership yes. different yes. to enable well, it. There is, there is a disconnect. There is an unhealthy disconnect, which I would have identified. And there is a fear of stepping outside, putting your head up. I feel that there is a disconnect from the top down. And that whole vicious circle needs to be broken because we need to think another way. Because we run a risk of losing out and losing even the standards we have unless we grasp opportunity. And the, the appetite is there. Yeah. No doubt it is there. And I'll be following through on this once we finish today. I will be following through to get a movement going towards the deep learning movement. Yeah, I love to be connected now, with you on that. Just one on this one point. Uh, I it would be great, and I think you're going to do this if you can capture the phenomenon of the fear of stepping out. Yes. And the appetite to step out. How do you reconcile yes. those two, two things? That'll be great. Absolutely. And I think it's it, a lot of it is based on um, fear, fear and a lack of real leadership, lack of the courage to just grasp it and go with it. There's, there's a disconnect. There is, a, it, as you say, piecemeal, piecemeal. We hit and miss but we miss more often than we hit. Yeah. And it's a pity because we have a wonderful system, but that system, we need to grasp what we have of the good of it at this point in time. But I was looking at your, um, you know, coherence framework and that notion of deepening learning. And I think in terms of our increased usage of technology. So, what do you see as the pros and cons of screen usage or screen dependence for our children? Let's say in terms of ability to learn and do the deep learning, to recall, to research, and to assimilate information. You know, if I were to quote the, the Steiner School, the Waldorf School approach where it would appear to me that the wiring of the brain is done in the traditional style initially, and then they're introduced to technology. But is there an argument that premature introduction to technology and dependence on technology robs the child of the opportunity to learn the skills of learning? Uh, yeah, for sure. I mean, I've... Um... I think about 10 years ago, I wrote a book called Stratosphere. And yes. I said, there are three things that are about the future. One is pedagogy. The other is knowing about change. And the third is technology. And, uh, and, and then I also wrote this driver's paper where I said, technology can be uh, an accelerator, but should never be a driver, a po policy-wise or strategy-wise. Yes. And then we have the new version. I, I don't know whether you saw my report on uh, the right drivers for whole system change. Yes. And one of yes. them, uh, they're paired. And one of the pairs is uh, social intelligence vis-a-vis -vis sure. artificial intelligence or machine intelligence. So if I step yes. back from this, this is very complex in many ways because uh, you could say, well, technology should play this or that role. But the fact is that technology imposes itself on the world every which way in an uncontrollable way. It's just all over, hidden and other not so hidden ways. So you can't avoid technology. Uh, you can provide guidelines and uh, we have done that. And I think the one guy, uh, uh, there's a combination of three, maybe three things. One is to make sure all students have access uh, this is, I'm talking about access to a device, a platform, and a, a, a place of using it, kind of minimum, uh, because you couldn't stop it anyways. It is happening that way, so why not make it more fair? And then the second is we've, uh, we've put our emphasis on well-being and, um, and learning. Uh, and uh, we have a neuroscientist on our team that's very, very much seamlessly part of our team. And well-being and learning is our foundational part. Uh, and so then... You, uh, you should, we want that's that's one foundational part. The second foundational part is new pedagogy, 
or pedagogy, which is a different relationship between the learner and teachers and others. So there's a lot of good ideas in that. They're not all new, uh, as you well know, they've been some of them around for a long time, but we're pulling them together. So if you have well-being and purpose, you have now uh, uh, better pedagogy, then you can introduce technology. If, you, if you're straight about your purpose and you're straight about your pedagogy, then you can take uh, yes. more than minimal technology seriously. And then we have our, our, in fact, our model, we call it leveraging digital. Uh, how do you leverage digital to go forward? So I think there's great dangers in technology uh, because it's, I mean, the technology phenomenon is main, mainly led in the last uh, 10 years or more, but let's say 10 years by white male wealth. Literally. Yes, absolutely. All the, all the companies, all the emphasis, all the profits, not all the profits, but majority of profits is all going in that direction. So the humanistic role of technology is to say, don't reject technology. That would be a mistake, but may reposition it so that it is part and parcel. And, uh, you know, I like the, uh, you can say, well, don't, uh, don't introduce it too soon. And I agree with that, but that's hard to control. I mean, if students are just... Sure. Uh, Three-year-olds. I right think there. the horses bolted. It, it already is in there. Yeah. But it, it's to teach the children digital literacy, the management of the the um, technology. And I think our experience here in Ireland has been that children became more tech savvy than their parents, and it got out of the control of their parents too soon. Yeah, so that's right. So the dependence it, it is taken over, and it has actually interrupted the attention span and teachers yes. will report that and mm -hmm. uh, you know this even um, the the screen the, the screen syndrome and that whole thing of not being able to concentrate for any longer than a short period or able to retain what they have heard you know yeah. but new learning you say needs to be irresistibly engaging technologically ubiquitous and steeped in real life problem solving and involve deep learning. What demands does this place on the teacher? The teacher who is in the traditional mindset. Well, we think you mentioned that children are more tech savvy than their, the adults. Uh, I, would, I would say um, sure. yes and no. Uh, that is they're in, in a technical sense, they're more tech savvy, but in a learning sense, they aren't yes. necessarily. Uh, you know, they can be whizzes of this, this, and this, but not really know how to, you know, how to think better. Uh, so I think sure. the approach, approach is not to deny technology, but to have it as part of, uh, in our case, it's part of four drivers. Well-being and learning is driver one. Uh, second driver is uh, social intelligence. Sure. Third driver is investment of money uh, by the system into capacity building. The fourth driver is system this. So as long as that's your your part uh, and then you 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 then you know use technology use other things that are part of that but i think we uh, it's it's not very productive to take absolutist stands technology sure. should not do this or whatever because uh, you you can't control that but you can control the positive no. agenda to say if we shape it this way and we have we students have who are learners and that's the fundamental part and they're concerned about purpose and well-being, and so are the parents, and so are the teachers. Yeah, there's a place of technology. Where does it fit? Let's use it. And, and the people will find themselves they're using it anyways without knowing everything. I mean, artificial intelligence is all over us, so it's, it's there. It's there. We just have to well, recognize it. It's and use to it. control it. It's it's to use technology as the tool, as opposed to being enslaved by it. Really, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's. It's an age-old problem with humans and uh, and technology, anyway. So uh, humans are always faced with uh, how do they use the advances of modernity, because uh, you can misuse. So, it. is deep learning really is aided by technology if used properly? Yes. Yeah. You you need. It's one of our when we have a in our uh, learning design, we have four components. One is uh, yes. uh, students, uh, uh, students as uh, learners. Second is partners in learning. Third is changing the learning environment. Yes. And the fourth is uh, digital, uh, uh, digital leverage. So those, those four yes. feed on each other uh, that you, uh, 
if you're if you're having good pedagogy, it's interacting with digital. If you're having partnerships and learning and changing environment and the goals of the six C's, they're all impinging on a technology yes. and in and in mm -hmm. receiving a kind of technology in return. So it's 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 got to be it's got you got we have to have a small number of connections that are core for this to work. Not twenty connections. Sure. We can't handle that, but we can um, handle four, five, or six. Keep it simple. Yep. So your coherence framework concentrates on focusing capacity, focusing direction, creating collaborative cultures, deepening learning, and securing accountability. Where do we here in Ireland, for instance, post-COVID, where do we start in achieving the synergy of all four elements in leading schools and I suppose in leading the entire system. Where we did had, we start? Yeah, Joanne Quinn and, and I uh, wrote that book. She's our co-leader in deep learning. Yes. And we published it in 2015. Uh, and the four pieces that you just mentioned are pretty still sound, I'm gonna say, uh, but they weren't one, two, three, four. They were uh, dynamically interrelated. So focusing direction sure. and collaborative culture and deep learning and accountability were, uh, kind of reverberating around each other. So in the newer work, now that we've had uh, six years of using those ideas, we have re uh, tweaked them uh, into the deep learning yes. framework. Into the deep learning, very I've, good. I've tweaked them also into the drivers. So now there's a, we're pretty clear that uh, the focusing direction has to be now steeped in well-being and learning not just focusing direction, any old direction, but the, the depth of that uh, shift sure. of the system and uh, collaboration, which we now say there's nothing, uh, collaboration isn't automatically good. You can collaborate to do nothing or the wrong thing. So this is why I like connected autonomy. It's particular collaboration sure. around deep learning. And then deep learning, we've fleshed out more. And then accountability, I'm going to want to say we've, uh, we've taken care of it because if you have a transparent system within a school doing this work, they have no trouble with external accountability. They, they get political power and they get pedagogical power by the nature of their work. They're more confident, not only about stepping out locally, but they will face the external system much more powerfully. They're not gonna be pushed around, but they're also not gonna spend their energy fighting this. If they don't, we say, you may be stuck with policies, but you're not stuck with mindset. So if, a, if you don't like a policy, blunt it and do the good stuff and, may, and make the community and students thrive. I, I like the Finnish system where in 1991, they got rid of their inspectorate and they introduced this five-year master's program for teachers. They attracted the bright, the bright and, and, and very interested people who wanted to be, to be in teaching for the right reasons and their system turned inside out, but the, it's all resting on trust. Trust in the educator as the professional, as the expert. And I think at times that may be absent in terms of the perception of the educator in Ireland at least, and I'd say across many nations. Yeah, I think that's an interesting question. I, um... Our colleague, you will, well, most of us know Linda Darling Hammond from, Stran uh, from Stanford. Uh, she said what, when people were calling for the Finnish system in the US, she said, you can't fire your way to Finland. In other words, you can't fire your teachers and then hope, and hopefully somehow there'll be a magical replacement. So I think it's, um, I think uh, we have to be careful here because in, in Finland, first of all, they're different cultures. Uh, Finland is quite small, sure. but then so is Ireland. Uh, but it's also the case that in Finland, uh, trust is actually not the cause, it's the outcome. Once it becomes the outcome, the outcome. It, it, it serves its causal purpose. But you don't say, please trust me, and then we have a trust-based system. You have to build the trust. And I think uh, I don't want to imitate Finland. I don't want to imitate Singapore. I want to imitate who I am in Ontario, Canada, in Ireland, wherever it is, build your own system. Yes, take advantage of the insights from other countries, but make sure 
you leverage your own strengths. And I think what we've been talking about in Ireland is that the strengths have not been uh, leveraged. They are, they've been in the system, but they haven't been uh, leveraged. My, my uh, colleague, Peter Senge on the systems work, he said, what's odd about systems is that we have systems where the majority of people in the system don't like the system, but the system persists. So you have a, a majority, of, exactly majority of participants don't like it, but it still goes on. So there's a, there's a kind of a puzzle in there. The puzzle in there is start the system as process, Be, use these principles, look to other countries for insights, but not for solutions. We have a tendency in Ireland to always reference international best practice. And I'm always screaming, why don't we stand tall on our own two feet, on our own practice, look at other systems, take what's good from them, but be our own best practice. Yeah, I agree with that. And it's, you know, it gets hung up in that, you know, some people uh, complain or talk about the tall poppy syndrome, you know, with somebody, uh, the, the tall poppy pops up and it gets cut down by the rest because who do they think they are kind of thing. But I think we can change that and say, we're, we're actually, uh, what you have to raise up is not the individuals that are tall poppies, but the clusters and the, and the, sure. and the combinations of it, what we call social capital. So I do think it's, uh, uh, and you have it in your title of your theme, I think the hard questions, is Time Ireland said, we are better than we think we are, and we are better than the world thinks we are. In fact, actually, you do quite well on the traditional measures of PISA, so, uh, uh, which are not our best sure. measures anyways. But I think it's, it's time that uh, because of, and this is really where the, um, what I'm going to call the evolutionary symptoms of... Uh, sure. No, two things is that the, the physical world is wrecked and the social world is wrecked in terms of trust plummeting in most places. So a physical and, and, uh, and social, and those are, there are strengths that Ireland has that we now, you, you can now say, let's start develop clusters of who we actually have always been, but never elaborated. Now we can Absolutely. elaborate it. And as and because a perfect excuse, let's say, to elaborate because of the dis, discombobulation question, it's a great reason to do it. But let's make sure there's a collective, sub sub collective, not you know, not everybody at once, but not individualistic. And let's get over our fear of uh, stepping out. Let's get over our reticence of uh, trying to push into the future and thinking that we're too big for our britches. We aren't. We need bigger britches, actually. Sure. Right. It, it all makes it makes sense to me, having been through the system in a leadership capacity for 30 years. Absolutely. You're bang on with that observation. But yeah. talk to me a little about nuance and context. Nuance. I love that, that, that notion. Yeah, context. Yeah. Nuance and context. Yeah, it's, uh, it's um, something. So I, the I new emerging that. purpose for education is the urgency to develop yeah. unity of purpose in which learners who can engage and thrive in an increasingly complex universe, the 21st century, come to the fore? And what role is collaboration in this process? Right, well, I can't summarize the whole book in, in such short order, but uh, I, I did publish the book and as uh, going back to my, my basic principle of the best ideas that come from leading practitioners, that book features leading practitioners doing this work. So what nuance is, is, uh, there's two big concepts. One is it gets below the surface of uh, normal uh, explanation and gets inside and in the leadership implication, the leadership participates as a learner with people and helping the move, uh, system move forward. So the, nice. the, the single distinguishing factor for starters, one of two, uh, so I should say the dual, is, uh, is that these leaders are participators in the context and they're learners. And so sure. one of the books made a nice distinction between a leader as apprentice and a leader as an expert. So they said most leaders should be both. Uh, and, when, and so this now gets us to context and the big breakthrough in nuance, although I'm sure people have said it in different ways, I, but I think the big one is that uh, uh, effective leadership is always contextual literacy. Contextual literacy is the leader understanding the culture in the context in which they are uh, leading. 
And wow. so uh, we said every time you change a job as leader, you become de-skilled to a certain part because you can't be skilled in the new context. Sure. So snap of a finger. And then downward uh, journey of learning. Yeah, and then con the, the, the global uh, or the pandemic helped us in that concept very much because it changed context for 100% of us. So now we have contextual literacy for 100%, new contextual yes. literacy. But it's always there for reasons that we change positions or society changes in some fact. And if society is changing, it means the context is changing. So I think if we got all leaders to be sensitive to those two pieces, uh, one is I have to be a learner because I, I won't be able to work with a given culture or situation unless I'm a learner because I have to know them and, and uh, be influenced by them and vice versa. And the second is I have to be humble enough to know that I have to learn contextual literacy over and over and over again. If I'm good at it, then I carry forward good ideas. So I'm not starting from scratch, but I am starting from a combination of I've got good ideas and this what what I think I can interact with you about. And secondly, I've got things to learn. Let me do that, let, let us do it. So it's a dynamic concept and it fits the modern times beautifully because the modern times are rife with continuous contextual change. Sure. And rife with opportunity to be grasped. But there is a, there's a fear that the pace of change will outstrip the pace that education is willing or capable of grasping at any one time. Yeah, well, try try leading in stagnation. Yeah, as the as the alternative. That's I mean, it. I mean, the rapid change is in some ways, and uh, uh, you said it. I think is rapid change or ra change is an opportunity to improve things. I mean, sure. changing context. That's, That's always if the, if the context was stagnant, we wouldn't have much opportunity to improve things. Context will never seems like it will never be stagnant again. So we need leaders who are skilled at achieving some degree of, uh, of settling down while they actually innovate. And sometimes that demand to innovate is more powerful as, as it is in 2019 and 2020 and so forth right now for two or three years at least. But that's uh, that uh, dynamic change is a leader's best friend. Sure. And having the autonomy to grasp it and go after it and having the courage to do it. Yeah. I think in Ireland, our principals, particularly our teaching principals, they're, they're trying to perform a dual role and they're, they're master of none because they're torn in all directions. We need a total overhaul of the system in terms of management versus leadership. I mean, a principal of a school really shouldn't be managing the, the building of the extension or the, the um, reconnection of electricity when it goes wrong or whatever, but it detracts from the time given to actual, the actual real job in education. I recall uh, in the 10 or so years I was interacting locally with so many people that that was, a, that was always the debate that where people say, yeah, management and leadership, uh, they're sort of pulling, management is pulling us away from leadership. But there was uh, the Primary School Principals Association did uh, position papers on it. They talked mm -hmm. about, uh, I, I would have recommended, find a way of uh, of taking care of the management side sure. so that you, uh, a, you know, it could be delegated. It could be, a, it could be a combination of schools having a, a, a manager that looked after the administrative sure. side, all of those things. Those ideas have been around for 20 years. Still I think. didn't happen. But it didn't happen. A, a, a lot of our, our progress is toward it maybe through lack of finance or lack of the will to put finance into it, you know? Yeah, but, that's a problem that can be solved, right? If you, if you try to solve it, you can solve it. Well, we found money when COVID happened and people yeah. were, were in lockdown and people got their payments, etc. But I noticed the OECD were quoted by um, the World Economic Forum in January as to possibilities for schooling going forward. And they gave four different possibilities. Schooling extended, education outsourced, schooling as learning hubs, and the fourth one, learn as you go. And I was struck by the wording of this one. It's education takes place everywhere, anytime. Distinctions between formal and informal learning are no longer valid. 
as society turns itself entirely to the power of the machine. Yeah. It's strong wording, isn't it? Yeah, I think, um, well, there's, uh, uh, you know, artificial intelligence has uh, got power. It's got power that could be, uh, end up being having massive negative consequences. So I'm always in favor of building up the human side. And I think, uh, I think because I, I mean, following evolution in many different ways is sure. I think we're at a new evolutionary period in, in humanity in 2021. And that, that new evolutionary period is, uh, it's not just a, a, a linear evolution from the past. It's brand new in some ways because of the physical and social challenges and all of these things. So we have, we're facing a solution we've never contemplated or encountered before. And I would be wary of extreme ones that, uh, that have any danger of extracting the humanity and the social collaboration that embedded in the best forms of humanity. That's, That's what we have to have as the anchor. Yeah, the That's anchor, the anchor of leadership, the anchor of the system must be human and social capital integrated, right? two way street. But there, there, there is another thinking out there that maybe is at the table of power, driving change in this great reset that we must watch and we must keep in control of, you know? Yeah, but well, there, there is a, um, a guy here called Kevin Impey who wrote a lovely book, Thrive in the Future of Work. And a quotation from that book struck me. For those with access to a decent education, most of the challenges that individuals face in the world of work and the future of work are within their control, though increased awareness and learning if they are open to adapting, upskilling and rebooting based on the evolving demands and opportunities for human labor, talent and skills. What would you consider a decent education? I would say that that quote is probably um, exceedingly dangerous characterization of the future because it seems to be mostly, uh, success is mostly about economic success and work success sure. and, and, the, and the, uh, the agenda that got us into trouble in the first place. So I think that is, uh, that, that's wrong. And in my, in my report on wrong drivers, I talked about academic obsession or obsession with uh, technology and success and I said, uh, the research shows that these people are being successful, this portion of people, but they are the wounded winners, a phrase that one of the research nice. criticism of that. The wounded winner is someone who's uh, successful at a system that's probably not a good system for humans. Sure. And I think what, that's what that re represents. We, the wo those who have access to technology and other resources are better off in a narrow sense. They'll do better in the, in the financial sense, but they're not better off as humans. They're not better off in helping shape society for the better. We need a cross-section. In fact, I would go so far as to say that those people, especially young people who are uh, uh, on the receiving end of a bad system have more ideas for better change for humanity than those students who have been successful on, a, on the bad system. So this is this makes it rather an interesting uh, dilemma. So I suppose about where to our go from emphasis here. really is on the holistic, the whole, the holistic education, not just on the student as the future worker. Holistic has more checks and balances in it as a system. And in this line of thinking, would we be more running the risk of a two-tiered system, the skilled versus the unskilled, the haves versus the have-nots? And more, more sizable number of people being left behind. Um, yes, for absolutely for sure. And I want to say it uh, for, in two ways. One is the haves and the have-not system that you you know implied is a distinct and a probable possibility in some ways, and it would be a bad one. That's point number one. It would be bad for overall for society. And secondly, it would be bad for the haves. The haves will eventually lose out. Because In, every time yeah. you have this kind of hierarchy, they can lead for a while, but their position and uh, Wilkinson and Pickett, who have done the uh, analysis of, they basically say, uh, fine, and they've done them with a demographic analysis, that those with a 
clear data, those societies that are more equal, even though they've advanced compared to those societies that are less equal, that in the less equal societies, when you project them, those at the top have shorter lifespans than the more equal society, those at the top. I hope that's clear. It's a complicated analysis, but it basically says, if you think you're on the top and the system starts to get extreme, extreme top and bottom, you will eventually be vulnerable because you will be a wounded winner and you will not do well in terms of your life expectancy or the quality of your life. Eventually, it will be bad for humanity. Right. You know, what would your hope for the future be? My hope for the future is uh, the thriving of uh, the, the global comp competencies for vast majorities of people. And uh, we know that uh, the gap between the, the rich and the poor, the equity question, is a problem in its own right in some ways, but it's a more serious problem for the disintegration of society. So my hope sure, would sure. be that the gap between uh, in, uh, those that are better off and those that aren't, which has actually increased in the last 40 years, astronomically almost, that that gap not only would be reduced, but the overall combination would move forward and higher on the well-being learning dimension, not on the skill technology dimension, because the sure. latter is a trap. The latter is a, uh, a highway to a wrong destination. Sure, sure. So that emphasis would be on DEI, um, the, the, the diversity, equality, and inclusion, and the arrival of the majority. To and and, and, new, and, and new, qu new qualities of the learners. Uh, it's not just reducing the gap. It sure. is reducing uh, people at both uh, higher and lower levels that we have now with better qualities that I've, we've called the global competencies and the thriving and well-being. The overall system gets uh, more fair or more equal, but also everybody moves up in that direction. Brilliant. I love your work. The best of luck with your research, et cetera. I intend to stay in touch with you and I'm going to, I'll send you an email in relation to your upcoming course on November 1st, 2nd and 3rd. And uh, I'll get a group together for you. And we, we start a movement, yeah? That'll be fabulous. I like your approach and I like your uh, digging. So I think if, uh, yeah, if you join us on November 1st, 2nd and 3rd, you can be a proactive, uh, we can keep going anyways, but let's, uh, let's make sure that Excellent. we have a chance to follow up and build, uh, build something better. Excellent. Thank you. I know you're busy, you're a busy man. You uh, do a lot of important work and I, I'm privileged that you took the time out to talk to me. Thank you so much and the best of luck. Uh, you're, very, you're very welcome, Teresa. Thank you very much, Teresa. Thank you.